Welcome everybody. I hope more people still joining. Um, thanks for joining us uh, in this uh, in this early morning session. Um, you've probably no doubt been listening to Perry myself. Um, formal invitation. I'm Jonathan Richards. I'm CEO of Breathe, and talking with Perry Timms, who's also CEO, but Chief Energy Officer, okay. which is awesome. One um, love to explore that a little bit because energy is a an important mm. thing for us. Um, mm. But particularly today, we're talking about Agile, which is, I know, uh, um, an important topic for you. Yeah. Um, ever since I've known you, you've been a, an advocate of Agile working. So when we were looking for um, a topic to start sharing on some some webinars at this time, your name clearly came to the top of the list as, as having some really valuable things to share. Um, so I mean, I'll let you do the the intro yourself. But you know, when it when it comes to to agile working or flexible working or working from home, it's something that a lot of companies have dabbled with. Um, some successfully, some not. Some shy away from it. Some wouldn't do it any other way. Um, so again, we just thought it would be good to get um, get some conversations going around uh, around how it works. Um, so before we sort of kick it off, um, Perry, I know you're, I'm just going to read this here because this is great. You're Chief Energy Officer, founder of PTHR, three times HR's most influential thinker. Congratulations on that one. Thank you. Um, I know you're a TEDx speaker as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, why don't you do a little bit of intro of yourself? Sure. Um, you know, give us a little yes. bit more about your background um, and then we yeah. can, can kick it off. Yeah, so um, I came into the workforce through the civil service, actually, and I suppose I've got a lot of respect for my former colleagues now who are absolutely trying to keep the country moving and adapting yeah. to all sorts of things. So um, it taught me a lot, got me into some really interesting project work, I'd say, probably around the um, early 90s and technology was being introduced and I got a little bit of a leaning towards that. So me and technology and projects have always been quite uh, closely sort of intertwined. And as a result of it, around about the late 90s, I started to to work remotely so I had an office but it was in London and I wasn't based there so I didn't have to commute all the time and this was when technology wasn't quite as slick as it is now thankfully um, so some dial-up access with the whole noise thing that we remember right. um, yeah. and a rather uh, rather large mobile phone like this but about four times as thick that had a slidey keyboard and I could email on and stuff like that so I got used to that and I quite liked it um, so so I've been remote working for about 20 years and then around about 2012 set up um, PTHR which stands for people and transformational HR um, and the idea really behind that was for me to explore all those things I really like about dispersed workforces self-managed systems and, and almost non-traditional methods of working and that's pretty much what I consult and advise and, and guide people on but you're right Jonathan agile has come into that mix as a methodology and a mindset uh, probably for, for for about the last 10 years and certainly the last five very actively yeah. um, and that's really the sort of thing that the company does now it helps companies be more agile and of course we're all doing that now yeah, yeah so, totally. <laughs> whether we like it or not yeah, yeah that's the potted history of me so before we get into to really into the, the the depths of agile what does a typical working from home day look for you you've done it so mm. much how do you structure it Mm. It's an interesting one because uh, there's uh, the link is to the energy thing in, in the title that I've got really and I almost set myself up on a day thinking where's my energy at have I got to do some really complex things have I got to do some very outward facing contacting things or have I got yeah. to do lots and lots of little things. And of course, we probably could all say well it's a combination of all of those but but it feels quite important to get in order in my mind, what I've got the most energy for at that time. Now, right. I, I sometimes get up really early, and if that's the case, I'm like, well, I can't do the outward facing things because nobody's there. Yeah. So then I go, do I do lots of small things or do, do I feel like doing something really big and deep? And so I sometimes allow myself to oscillate between that. So I don't have a set day, but I do start out thinking, what do I need to expend um, and in what way today? So um, there are things I should do which are pretty deep and big, but I might not have the energy for them. So I'll do lots of little things. I guess my key is I just need to be at my best and understand where I'm at my best. So my routine changes, but I quite like the variety. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Yeah. And and I think <clears throat> no, I've found over the last sort of 
two weeks. Well, I was just saying earlier on, we've been now working from home as a company for three weeks. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've adjusted fairly well to, to, to being at home, but actually what I'm finding is, is I have to put a lot more energy into communicating. Definitely. No, it's, 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 there's the so far as i'm concerned <clears throat> excuse me mm-hmm. at the moment there is no limit to the amount of communication that i need to do yeah. with the team I'd agree with and that. one of the really interesting things that we've added in is just the ability to drop in on somebody mm. you know when you walk past their desk and you smile and mm. say how are you it, mm. we started to do that so mm. you know, it can get a bit annoying but we'll we'll drop in on a we use microsoft teams mm. uh, we use zoom for the bigger meetings mm. but we'll mm. we'll sort of just ping a message to somebody and say, Hey, you're around, you fancy a chat and we'll mm. just do a two minute coffee machine talk. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's really important in this kind of distanced um, way of being right. Because you can't do the eyeball thing. You can't no. raise your hand and walk <clears throat> over. And and we do miss that. And like you say, sometimes it's an interruption, but a welcome interruption sometimes. Other times we just feel the need to do that. Don't we? So yeah, I would agree that it's good to replicate those on platforms. So, um, so the team and I use Slack. I mean, there's, uh, seven of us in different time zones and so we do the same thing we have a channel that's called daily check-in we quite literally go how are we feeling what are we up to yeah. and we all just <clears throat> post that and it sparks things and we have private messages and threads and we have little chats a bit like you do and then we've just decided to have an you know like an all team gathering for about half an hour where we just don't have an agenda we just go how's the week been and just yeah you know share and yeah. I, think, I, I think we should do that yeah, and we've had um, we've had one or two experiments. I mean, the company quiz now is a is a regular in <laughs> the week thing. Got got two of the team who are just awesome at organising the quiz. Nice. Um, but one that we've also experimented with that we need to do more of is actually just sitting there eating our lunch together. Mm. And we'll open up yeah. a Zoom meeting. Whoever wants to, it's just like mm. sitting in the um, in the kitchen at work. Mm. Yeah. And, so look, again, um, <clears throat> good good point. Yeah. Um, just wanted to to get really into the the subject of today and agile. Mm. Mm. Um, so give us a, give us an overview of what agile is about. Give us the sort of couple of minutes. Yeah. You can dig um, into it. And I think there's, there's two, um, sort of threads I'll talk about. So there, there's agile as in being response, responsive and not fixed and that kind of thing. And I think a lot yeah. of us have had to be that since lockdown, right? So there's yeah. that definite kind of, um, uh, unhooked and non, uh, orthodox way of doing things. Yep. Um, and then there's another one, which is actually a little bit more of a structure and a flow, but still meant to be responsive, but it gives you a chance to, to be orderly even within that sort of responsiveness. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the non-fixed one, the slightly adaptive one, and then a a lot more time talking about the method type approach because we could find that really comforting uh, when we're not able to have those meetings and those formalities. We can bring a bit of light touch formality and actually give us some real nice parameters to work in so i'm going to spend more of it talking about that one if that's okay okay yeah no absolutely i think i think that's it okay so um where does a where does a company get going how do they start thinking about doing things agile Mm. in an agile way yes okay there's this we're all forced into to being a bit more flexible but let's try and get some structure around agility yeah. So I think your first point on comms is, is really where we'll start, which is the worst thing we could do is just kind of shrink back and, and not start to communicate and, and actually almost go a little bit over the top and communicate a lot more than we used to. Mm. Um, so the concept I like on this, if people want to Google it and look it up after it, is, is working out loud. It's where quite literally you, you don't quite commentate everything you do, but you share much more openly, like on a platform or in a little group chat or something about what you're up to. Yep. Um, and that's important for a couple of reasons, right? One, so people go, oh, now I might be able to help you with that. So you might get a little bit of serendipitous support, but also you would probably get people, you know, just just aware of what you're doing and appreciating it. So they could check in with you further down the line and say, so did you get that research done? Because it looked like it was complicated. It just brings people the chance to create some feedback. When we're not in the same space, I think the worst thing we can do is just toil away, toil away, toil away. No, nobody really knows. and You don't get any sense of recognition, appreciation or value that can be tough that can be debilitating so communicate and let people know what you're up to in a good way um uh, it almost negates then the need for managers to supervise if that makes sense yeah because as a, as a manager i can imagine now with this flexible working you're like so how, how do i check in how do i know they're not 
in the patio, <laughs> you know, yeah. all day and all that. And it's like, well, probably the worst thing you could do is, is scrutinize more yet you feel a sense of discomfort that you want to optimize what people are up to so they get fulfillment and we get the work done. Well, let them come to you. Let them share with you more about yeah. what they're doing, what they might need from you as a manager. And I think dial down the supervision and dial up the support. So, you know, say to people, look, if I check in, it's not because I'm not trusting you. It's because I want to know whether you need anything from me and that you're not lonely and yeah. you can get some help. Right. Yeah. So, sounds like how you're operating it. Yeah, great. totally. Um, no, I, I sort of made a slight joke earlier on about checking in with the, the extroverts because <laughs> yeah. uh, they're the ones that are, that are missing it. Um, what we do a lot of is actually trying to look out for the people that we're not in any touch with. Mm. No, that aren't talking to us, mm. that, that seem to be the ones that are always on mute or always quiet mm. in meetings. Mm. Mm. Um, had a question in from Nancy about, mm. um, how do you get chit chat going from an organization that tends to be sort of head down and doesn't have any chit chat in the organization? How do you start that mm. up? Um, uh, well, I guess uh, you wouldn't want to impose something. So, you, you know, yeah. for people that are not, not normally like that, when we're in the same place, you don't want to suddenly drop in, you know, um, uh, some, uh, online test where you have to work out what movies are from icons i've seen a few of those because people are yeah. like, oh that's just an interruption i don't want that but but ask them what what would be useful to share and be open about and so it might be coding tip of the day it might be you know uh, i found a great hack on how to you know publish something without you know delay or something so yeah. you could generate something around um again this narrating what you do with people who are proud of what they do and don't normally share it like that because you're not in the same space you can't just call somebody over to your screen and say look at what i just did because, oh that's good i'll use that so you have to externalize yeah. that but that's the kind of chit chat i try and get people to share useful things practical things but let them be the yeah. architects of that themselves and also i mean that that um, brings to mind there's something that we've we've had different teams in breathe they've always had a daily stand-up um yeah. now every team in breathe has a daily stand-up right. um and some of them even have two they'll have one at the beginning yeah. and one at the end and i think that's an important it, it again mm. it's the kind of stuff that you just sort of know what somebody else is working on yeah. when you're in the office yeah. together but when yeah. you're not in the office together it just just gives somebody the ability to have a 30 second this is what i'm at mm. this is where i'm going and as you said earlier on that means that mm. people can um yeah can actually just sort of absorb what else is going on in the organization yeah. so a daily yeah. stand up the other thing as well i think is that sometimes when people don't want to talk they still want to hear yeah so there's something that we have at Breathe, which is a Monday morning, 15, 20 minutes, which is largely just me giving a state of the nation. Yeah. Now, how it went over the last week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I always get a lot of positive comments from that about how it's just, it's just good to hear mm -hmm. how the, what the pulse of the organization is mm. like. Um, mm. And then we'll get people yeah. kicking in who will, who will, um, will do that. Mm. Mm. Okay, so let's let's start digging down into some of the agile methodology because yeah. um, yeah. I think there's some really useful useful yeah. tools in there. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so a couple of things to bear in mind is that um, normally when people work together uh, in an office space, they can kind of huddle somewhere or, um, you know, find somewhere and they can talk things through. And, and because we're distant, we might have to do it in a different method. And, and so just talking to a comment in the chat, actually, about what kind of platform do you use to do that? Um, I often say the one where, where people go to quite naturally. And so if that's an email group, if it's a, a Slack channel or a Microsoft Teams channel, or a workplace by Facebook or Yammer or whatever it is, I, the more chatty and conversational, I think, the better it would be to yeah. start with. So, so try and get to people um, where they are. Um, WhatsApp groups are okay, but they can get very long threads and get very, um, you know, sort of lost. So uh, I think anything where it's more like cards or spaces rather than just a continuous stream I find yeah. is more useful yeah. for, for people. So once you've established that and, and you know it could be that the first thing you do is say we want to work out loud like this and we want to share and collaborate a bit more shall we all go off and find some platforms come back and share and agree which one we can use yep. um, 
I'd, I'd get them to do some of the legwork for you rather than impose it. But Teams and Slack are, are really good. So if you want a place to start, they are pretty good yeah. for that. Um, and then I think it's important that uh, in that sort of situation, if you've got a problem to work on together, that you say, OK, what what is the problem? What's the definition of this problem? And you spend a little bit of time actually defining what the problem is, because it may be that somebody quite flippantly says, look, you know, we've got a customer over here who wants an adapted product and, and, and we've got to deliver that because that's part of our order process. Yeah. Um, can, can you work out how to make that adaptation? So that's the problem. Right. And then you go, OK, so that sounds like what adaptation <laughs> for what kind of. So you've got to think about it a little bit more, um, a little bit more deeply and, 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 and define that problem collectively. So you all go, now we know what we're solving. Um, so that's the first part, which is be very clear on what you're together there to do. Um, and in Agile, that's often called a problem statement. You make it a very yep. defined thing. And there is a hypothesis for it. You say when something happens, they want to do something, but something gets in the way. And it's quite literally that simple. When they want to do something, um, uh, something happens. They they want to do something, but something gets in the way. So, I mean, I'm quite happy to post something like that um, after this uh, so that people can get to grips with it. And then at least you know what you're there to do. So you all agree what the problem is. The next question I find that's really useful in working in an agile sort of sense with a kind of methodology and approach to it is you then say, well, who owns that problem? Whose problem is it? in yep. this company because it might might be me fixing it but i probably need to give it to somebody who can then sanction it sign it off authorize it use it and that's not always you that could be a head of department a specialist customer yeah. service agent whoever it is and so you agree who owns it because that's important for you to then know if i want to bounce an idea that is perhaps a bit controversial i might need to go to them and say look we've never done it this way before are you prepared to stand and own the accountability that this is a new completely you know pioneering track to go yeah. on in a small company i think that's that's often quite easy because you're like well this person gave me this piece of work to do so therefore they're the owner well okay just agree that um, yeah. but but let them know that they're the person who owns it so that when you give it to them, it's up to them to make it come to life and use and all those kind of things. So that there's an assumption that you're building something for them. Right. So those are the first two founding things. And from that point on, I think then you can work out, well, who, who, who's the problem solving going to help? And so it may be that in the example I gave, it's one customer who wants an adaptation. And so you go, well, what do we know about that customer? And you start to think about them, not just in that small piece of work perhaps you're trying to put together, but like, you know, how, how often do they need this adaptation? Uh, are there others who would need this adaptation? Can we can we use it as an opportunity to create something that's more adaptive, not just for this person? And if that's the case, then who are the other customers who more, might want this adaptation? And how can that influence what we do? So I think that's really important to understand the users of your solution. Um, and in terms of working in this in a dispersed way, you would normally you'd huddle in the same space. Right. This is this is where a platform or a conversation like this with people on it, if it's managed nice and tightly, could still get you there. But those yeah, yeah. three things to start: what is the problem? Define it. Who owns it? And who's it for? That's the first step. And maybe we can pick up a couple of questions. Okay. If, if there's anything. Just on just one thing I wanted to touch on there is that that agile is often seen to be a a technology software led yeah. sort of thing. And actually, yeah. no, I, I started to see it being used in so many different environments and really, no, I think you've, 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 you've nailed it there with the starting point is just properly understanding the problem. Yeah. And so often we kick into, I mean, CEO, that's, that's, it, it's mm. written into my job description that I try and solve <laughs> a problem before I know what the problem yeah. is, yeah. Um, which is not a good thing to do. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, on, on some of the questions. So what, what we'll do is, well, um, we wanted to be very responsive on this this talk because yeah. we've had questions come in. We've got more questions yeah. coming in by the chat. Yeah. So we haven't got any formal slides or anything together for it. But what we will do is to put out notes afterwards. We'll yeah. put out the recording and we'll put out lists of, yeah. of the tools we're talking about. Yeah. We'll point you to Definitely. some other resources. Let's just have a look at some of the questions. Um, 
how do we look after introverts and extroverts? Mm. Mm. So in a, when you're getting yeah. into an agile environment, you're going to have some people yeah. who, if you're in a meeting, yeah. in a huddle, in a business, yeah. in an office, you would see the people that weren't, weren't getting involved, that weren't talking, yeah. the ones that were. How would you do that when you're, how would you get everybody around the table to, to contribute? Yeah. And I think that's a good point. So in a Zoom situation like this, for example, you'll get that thing where the, the extroverts are kind of jumping over each other to do the talking, being a bit stereotypical, but that tends to be the case. So it's a difficult etiquette anyway in this kind of thing when you've just got people on, on, on a video. It seems you can read the signals sometimes a little bit less about somebody wanting to come in or interject or add to a point. So I would sort of keep these kinds of chats to I suppose just some uh, almost like open exchanges where somebody is like a facilitator and host it and say okay right. so so this is the problem can I one by one check with you what your reaction is to that problem and just let people go in turn it sounds a little bit like you've got to build a few processes into that but I think that's fair then to allow people a introverted to think about it and be extroverts to not just keep talking all over each other but keep it quite tight. Don't do it for more than you know, 10 minutes if you can avoid it, because I think it can get very tiring one at a time just listening to people and not having any interaction. Um, and then you can say to people, right, OK, so if we've got these um, reactions and understanding to it, can we now go off? Can we jump on a channel? Yeah. Can we type in what we're now thinking, having heard other people's view, and perhaps in a shared document like a Google Doc or a Word document that's on 0365, Office 365 that people can join in and, and co-create, right. li literally use it as if you were writing on a whiteboard and people rubbing bits out and adding bits in. Because I think you'll get introvert, extrovert play through both of those, video and a tool or a platform. Um, so I think the outcome of that then would be a co-created live stream of thought almost that you can then go to a definition and say look we've been playing around with this this looks like the problem definition now that might sound like a lot of time has elapsed but really that's probably 20 minutes in a day that everybody's just focused on this yeah but it'll be a worthy 20 minutes yeah, yeah okay so look we've got we've got the we've got the problem identified yeah we've started to flesh it out we know who is the problem for We've yeah. got our statement started to work out. Yeah. yeah. Where do we go? Do we actually kick then into right now we're going to go and do it? Or, or where do we go? So I think once you've got that problem established, you know who's owning it and you've started to almost create a trail that you can use. I mean, there's a, a comment in the chat window that says sometimes in a chat room, comments can get really big. So would you set up a chat room or a thread or a space for each problem? Hell yeah, yeah. I would. I wouldn't just yeah. have a general thing and everything goes in there. I'd say this is important enough a piece of work that it devotes its own thread. Um, so I think that's what you do. You start to create an infrastructure that kind of supports you and separates out what would normally just be kicked around in opposite desks or pick up phones and stuff so that you can keep almost like an order to that. So I, I sort of counteract the large chat by breaking the chat up. So okay. it's context yeah. specific. Yeah. yeah. And that gets, that gets back to, um, David's asked us a question about, you know, they've got a chat system. It, it just, yeah. the, the chat just gets a mile just, long. Yeah. Um, and yes, very definitely break chats up into, yeah. into smaller mm. chats. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's always a balance between is a chat a record of what's been done or is mm. a chat just like, mm. you know, it just, just, it just evolves mm. over time mm. and it, you'd never look back. Yeah, I think the chat is that. It's not the record of what's been done. It is literally the, the the thoughts and the words you would have said to somebody who's in the room, just historically connected uh, and collected. So, um, so I do things like tasks in some of the space, right? So once you've started to think what's the problem and who owns it and who's it for, and you have that defined in your thread and your thinking, then you can ask people to think, okay, um, and this is an agile thing actually, what are the tasks that we need to perform in order to get this from where we are now to what we need to do, which is the solution. Right. And that, that can be done in an incredibly dispersed fashion because people can type into a document, you can set up a spreadsheet if you want to, um, or you can 
can use um, apps and, and platforms that do this kind of thing where you can actually type in tasks. So um, just to name drop a few, you've got Trello, which works on cards. You've got Asana, which works on tasks and connectedness. You've got Microsoft Planner Planner. that links into the 0365 thing. Um, Like I say, you can put them on a spreadsheet. There are some post-it note type replications in the online environment like Mural and one called Miro. And again, we'll put all these links out. Don't worry about it. They literally, you you type into a yellow sticky and you place it on a virtual whiteboard and people can see and move them about. And it's not quite as good as writing on one and sticking it in, in the space, but in the situation we're in, good enough for now. Yeah. But, but you do this massive download of tasks. And if people do that separately, you think, well, aren't you just duplicating it? It's like, if everybody thinks something's got to be done, that's telling you something's got to be done. Yeah. So let them have six versions of it, create yeah. the best one out the other end. So, so that's called a backlog in Agile. That's called right. a backlog. Yep. So I go from pro, um, problem, uh, owner, uh, users, uh, to start to build your task okay. list. And I'd also add that, again, if... If we're building something like Breathe has just launched a rotor product. Now, if we're building that, which is six or nine months worth of development, then the backlog is huge. But actually, if we're doing, we use the same process for if we're just doing a small tweak to the system. Yeah. It's because it just means you only do it once. Yeah. Uh, If if you're going to, if you're going to fix a problem, understand Mm. the problem, understand who it's a problem Mm. for, Mm. give a short description as to what it is, and then you can pass it on to whoever's going to do it. And they know they're doing it and no, it's fixed. So it's, it's very much a methodology that scales with, Mm. with the Mm. size of the problem. Mm. So I'd say if we're taking this sort of agile concept then into a, a, a current dispersed state, once you've got that list already starting to form, you can then come together in a sort of chat environment like this and go, right, okay, now we've, we've identified, you know, 120 things to do. And you've kind of ordered them through chat and stuff. Yep. But then you can start to say to people, okay, are we, are we clear on a deadline? And, and people go, yes, we have to get this finished by the end of May. And we're like, okay, great. So, so out of these tasks, where do we start? What do we do? And you're going to have a discussion then about the important stuff that you can do now and stuff that's on that list, but you're like, you can't really do that until we've done some of the early stuff. Or actually, it doesn't even need to be done until right. we've done more so you start to build a little bit of separation in those tasks and cluster them almost like in either theme or timeline because what you're then doing is you're creating your product roadmap yep and what that says is we don't need to do everything this week but the things we really need to do this week is this piece of research this decision this purchase uh, whatever it might be yeah. and in that chat you can then say well, who wants to do what? <laughs> Literally yeah, yeah, invite yeah. people to pick tasks. And, and it might be that somebody says, well, I'll do, I'll do the purchase bit, but I've, I've not done it before, so I might need some help. And I would say don't resist that because if people are feeling they want to do something, there's a reason for it and you should let them do it. Yeah. And if they need to learn it the next time, they'll not yeah. need to learn it. So use it as an exercise to kind of stretch your competence so nice. work out priorities and invite people to pick what they want to do that sounds a bit controversial but that's where i'd go yeah. next okay and i i just pick up on um use the term product roadmap yeah and and again that can make it sound like a big and expansive like we're building the fourth road bridge or whatever it is yeah. but it can be um it could be a project roadmap it could be a solution roadmap it's just a roadmap yeah. of actually what you're going to do yeah. I, i'm here i need to get to there the yeah. other bit that i really love about about prioritizing these tasks is i love looking at a point down the roadmap and say do you know what two-thirds of the way through my roadmap i've got most of my solution yeah so especially at the moment when we're all having to move so fast yeah I always quiz my team on how quickly can we get that out? At what point do we yeah. have enough that's worth releasing? Yeah, yeah, so for yeah. instance, we've just released functionality for furloughing right? Okay. Um, because it's there, it's needed. Of course. And we've got to the point where, where we can release it. It's not the full solution. We will get to that yeah. over time, but we've got something yeah. that, that people can start yeah. to use straight away. So it's always, it's always important to think, what can I get away with not doing? 
and in the tech yeah. world, in the startup world, it's it sort of goes by the the minimal mm. viable product That's kind it. of handle. Yeah. What's the smallest mm. I can get away with? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I just want to pick up on a question that's sort of slightly off tack, but few, but is all yeah. about working from home. Is mm. um, parents working from mm. home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids yeah. are home. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, that that's such a stressful, mm. such, mm. such a stressful place place to be. Yeah. Now, what tips have we got for for mm. helping helping parents? So bizarrely, you're probably the pioneer of agile working because you're having to switch your mind from teaching somebody to doing something and dealing with different levels of capability. So by nature, you're agile. Um, again, I mean, not having kids, I don't have that issue and I'm kind of grateful for it. But understanding that actually there are segments of time that you will need to sort of devote to this, then there's an open and understanding approach, I think, to your colleagues, which says, you know what, between 11 and 20 12, I've got to do the school thing. So do not expect me to contribute to chats or jump in on a call. But do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick up all my stuff at 6.30 p.m. because that's yeah. when I know I've got the headspace and I can do it. So again, I think we just need to stop thinking about our schedule being in our heads or in our calendar and let everybody know what our rhythm is yeah. and that that might disrupt. And, and that sounds really twee and doesn't really help because there's no life hack for this. But I think let people know that their expectations of you are different because of that. And I think that's the best you can Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, that's again, something that I can't stress enough is we, we touched on it earlier on. You cannot communicate too much at this time. No, no. And I think with parents, um, now people generally want to do a good job, don't they? They want to do a good job for mm. us, but their parents are going to get... Or their their kids are going to get their attention, yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm adamant that my team should look after their kids first, yeah. and that's now that sounds really nice of me, and we're in a great position to be able to do that. But actually, that's that's almost a bit selfish for me as well, yeah. because yeah. I know I won't get a good day's work out of yeah. out of one of my people if they're being constantly interrupted yeah. by their kids and the kids are unhappy yeah. and they'll get to the mm. end of the day and they're exhausted. I know. So yeah, it's it's actually that compartmentalizing the day. Mm. <clears throat> And the reality is, you know, some people are just going to be less productive mm. or they're going to be putting their productivity towards their children, not yes. towards their work. Mm. But when you've mm. got them on the work, you want them to be to be there completely. Mm. So letting them create the structure. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that has to be it. And somebody put in the chat about, you know, how do you let senior managers know that people are working because they don't trust them? Um, and again, it's a baffling thing for me, which is like, so what? So they, do they look over everybody's shoulder at what everything they're always doing in, in the office? Yeah. No, but because they're there and they're tapping into a screen, they think their product, productivity is, is okay. Yet if they're out of sight, they're not productive. It's like, well, if you work out loud and you show what you're doing and you show your progress, then I think that's the best thing you yeah. can do to have them watch what you're doing rather than check up on what you're doing. It's like, well, come join our channel then and see what we're up to. And, and you're surprised that you've been shown incre incredible dedication, commitment, creativity, togetherness. Yeah. Um, so keep, keep your draconian measures out, please. Uh, but watch what we do. I mean, uh, that sounds a little bit controversial, but it's like if you really don't trust your people that well, uh, why yeah. did you employ them in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, it comes it comes back to one that I know you and I have been banging on for years. We we spend a, a huge amount of time, effort, and money to recruit the very best people that we can. And one of the things we're testing for is fundamentally, are they an adult? Mm -hmm. And the moment we recruit them, so often we treat them like children. Yeah, um, definitely. Before we both get on our hobby horse. Mm. Um, tool fatigue is a, is a really interesting question from Ella. Yeah, yeah. So lots of, yeah. lots of collaboration, lots of tools, yeah. lots of record keeping. Yeah. At what point does the record keeping mm. take over from doing yeah. Yeah, it can get really baffling. And, and so, you know, I've closed down a lot of my browser windows, but I'm running WhatsApp, Twitter, LinkedIn, Slack, Asana, Gmail, Times2, um, a portal to, I've, I've probably got about 10 or 12 tabs open. And that to some people is an absolute nightmare. But do you know what I'd rather have is a spread in different places, knowing what those places are there for, than everything coming at me in one space. Now that's my preference. Yeah. So I know that Asana, 
Asana is where I have tasks and activities to do with tasks. Slack is where I chat to the team and just check in on them. Gmail is where clients get in touch with me. WhatsApp is where my friends and contacts get in touch with me. Twitter DM is those random. So I know what they're there for. And I think that's the important thing that you can establish as a team. It's like if we're going to have multiple channels, let's not cross those streams in a Ghostbuster sense. You know, yeah. I mean? um, let's have one for this, one for that, and one for the other. And that might sound like, oof, isn't that checking a lot of channels? I'd say that's better than everything coming at you in one. I, yeah. I hate to see everything go through email. Yeah. It yeah. becomes overbearing and stressful. Spread them out, I'd say, but with a purpose. And also, I think there's an important one there. You you were talking about um, you know, giving people a clear task to do and giving them the responsibility to do it. Mm. Once you've taken a project, you've understood what you're trying to do you've understood how you're yeah. going to do it mm. broken it down into the component mm. parts when you get to those component parts and you hand it over to somebody to do mm. so far as i'm concerned they tell you it's done and it's done no yeah. there, there's no need for the micromanaging around that no not um, at all you can keep supervision out of it because it can just be a visible act of of completion that actually still gives you the sense i've done it um, so the worst thing we could do is is just keep plowing on with the work and at the end of it go well, what is, what did i achieve there some kind of list of tasks is best way to go look at all those things yeah. i managed to get done and you feel a sense of gratitude you don't need to have too yeah. much feedback on that but it's still nice when yeah. you get it a couple of really good things come up in the chat um emily's just mentioned so, such an important one about having kids oh yeah um just doing zoom calls or teams oh, calls yeah. with kids on yeah. the lap that's awesome you know so far yeah. as i'm concerned if i'm having a meeting with with anybody in the company their kids are welcome to join yeah. And yeah, we maybe don't get as much done as quickly as we would have done, but we get things done. They're happier. They feel more included. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Kids in, in Zoom yeah. calls, pets in Zoom calls. Yeah. Um, it is, it's great. Um, and can I pick up on Flo's point about this time blocking? Please. Because I think that's so powerful, right? So we we do not work in one continuous stream, even if we think we do when we're in the office, right? We have disruptions, we have yeah. flow, and we have all sorts of things. So I don't think we need to do anything different when we're working at home. And there's a really nice technique that hasn't got any science behind it, but I think it works really well. It's called Pomodoro. Yeah, I love it. And it's 25 minutes of work, five minutes break. 25 minutes of work five minutes break and you know what that rhythm is really in sync with us because we need hydration we need rest we need a restroom we might need fresh air yeah and so the five minute gap in between the 25 just helps you disconnect but not too you know yeah. kind of disruptively yeah. so we could try that 25 5 25 Do you know five. yeah is I that have 25? A, a timer uh, it's actually 30 ah but you know, I can't get any sand out. I'd take a pinch out if I could. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, it's the same. And that that yeah. I use when I'm having trouble to focus. Yeah. So if I need yeah. to focus on a legal agreement or on a particular yeah. document or preparing yeah. for something, yeah. then I'll just yeah. flip that over and say, right, I've got half yeah. an hour. That's that's my yeah. my time span. I can reward yeah. myself with another yeah. cup of coffee or go and play with a yeah. dog or something. There's another really good technique I'll bring off the back of that that comes from Agile, right? And it's it's that the time it takes to do the work is really something we give credit to, right? So we put a piece of I've got to read this and do a summary and we just get on with it. Now, what we can spend time doing is say, I've got to read this and do a summary. How long is it going to take me to read it? You look at it and go, I think half an hour. Allow yourself half an hour. Then say, how long is it going to take for me to do the summary? probably an hour because i've got to really tighten it up and get some back yeah. research for it so why don't you do that work in half hour hour two hour four hour eight hour 16 hour slices for your project work and then you can kind of segment your time a little bit more wisely to it and you might say well if i'm doing emails that that they're only two minutes at a time it's like allow yourself half an hour or an hour to do emails yeah and then do something else so i think we can get ever so deliberate about apportioning time to the work we do which actually in agile helps you really op optimize like focus and, and and resource allocation they call yeah. it velocity it's how do you get the most velocity on completion so yeah yeah use time timings really crucial and um just another one from the chat alexi yeah uh, you know I, I feel for you honestly that's that's about the best i can say it's it's so tough what yeah. what i would suggest or see if you can do is is to try and do um do do this idea of time boxing but yeah. um it's sometime 
um, for your son, some time for your work, and just see if you can divide those two up. Um, tough, mm. tough, time. The, tough time. The other thing I'll say on that, uh, Jonathan, is sometimes find somebody who is either in your company or a friend and just say, look, I, I need somebody to help partner with me on understanding whether I'm doing the right thing time wise or whatever. So they're literally like a bit of a coach for you and just say, right, today I did this and this and this and I feel guilty about not doing this and this and this and get them to just kind of say, well, what did you expect to do and, and what did you do well and how do you yeah. feel about those things you didn't get done? Just kind of almost use them as a bit of a time coach for you. They don't even have to be an expert in it. Yeah. Just somebody yeah, yeah. who can help you make sense. Yeah. And we've, um, like a lot of organizations, we have a number of mental health first aiders in the organization and yeah. we're trying to work with them at the moment to be, be a little bit more eyes and ears out in the organization. And we're trying to, and I know it's difficult for, yeah. for people to, to mm. uh, pick up the phone, pick up the chat to their, to their line manager yeah. and say, Hey, I'm having a problem, yeah. but we're yeah. trying to use other people in the organization as a conduit, not to snitch on people for having, having a hard yeah. time, but just because everybody needs to know, and we need to share these things. Yeah. So I yeah. think the idea of the mental health first aider is, is really going to come yeah. into it. So yeah, I if think it wasn't so. important already that we've drifted no. off, off agile. Mm. Um, so we've got the problem sorted out. We've got, um, we've got Quite it, we've got it boxed. We've got our nice list. We've got people working on it. How often do we do a check-in? So again, you talked about daily stand-up. So I think there is a, 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 root, a routine or a ritual in Agile where people do that. And I think this talks to a couple of the other points about involving people, which is just do this quick, very, very quick check-in in the morning, if you can, like this on a video call, and just go, right, how did people feel about the work they did yesterday? And people go, yeah, generally good, bit frustrated I didn't get that done, so I'm going to focus on that today. It doesn't have to be too laborious, but just literally a sort of unpack yesterday and look ahead to today. That's all it needs to be. Mm. And that gives you a little bit of chance to be social and see people and, and give a bit of feedback and offer help. I still want to see us do quick 10-minute stand-up check-ins. Well, stand-up, they'll be sit-down yep. screen, won't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely do that, uh, and then um, allow people then to you know flag up if they need any help, or um, you know share something exciting they just found as a result of that task. So they can do some commentary on their work. Yeah. Um, and then the uh, the crucial thing I think that happens in agile is you also only commit to doing one thing at a time. So in a project, this client adaptation we've got to do, then somebody says, well, I'm going to do the research on the costing of what that adaptation is going to be. So that's my task. Um, but I also quite like to do the comms as well. It's like, well, you can't do both right at the same time. So why don't you just do the research on the finance first? Leave the comms because if somebody else can do it, they'll pick it up. And OK, you missed out, but at least it doesn't get left Whereas we sometimes in the normal sense things just hoard everything. It's like, I'm going to do all these things and nobody else can do them because yeah. they're in, in your work stack. Don't do that. Do one thing at a time. And then you feel the sense of moving it along as well. Yeah. And it means the backlog is there for anybody else to pick anything they want to um, uh, to do. So, so keep that rule in mind. One thing at a time. That's also good for your mental health because you are doing one thing and, and doing it well and then get another thing and then get another yeah. thing. <laughs> Um, so there was something that um, we had a, a a guy come to speak to us from Mind, the the mental health charity. Yeah, and he this was a few months ago, and he said one thing that really, really has stuck with me. And he talks about um, us being like we have a we have a bucket full of attention. Yeah, and and things start to fill the bucket up. Little things <laughs> start to fill the bucket up. Yeah, and the one that tips us over the edge when it just gets too much. Yeah. It's probably not the biggest thing that we have to solve, the biggest thing that we have to give our time to, but it's the one that mm. tips us over the edge that makes the bucket Good overflow. Point. Good and point. I think there it's so important to be able to, mm. well, I'm, I'm a list person, so I like to tick things off. I will do something and then write it on the list so I can tick it off. I'm, I'm that mm. sad about it. Mm. But it is important to try and understand everything that's going on in your world and, and to, mm. try and, to try and work it through. Um, yeah. There's there's a, a really interesting interesting question popped up on furloughing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so people on furlough, yes, who aren't supposed to be working. Of course not. How do you keep them in touch? And that's a tricky one. That I think the the 
from from my latest understanding is the regulations around it are starting to be clarified are, yeah. mm. in that they can be training they can yeah. they can be um communicated they with. can be communicated i tend to think about it like um like maternity in that mm. you have a legal obligation as an employer to keep somebody on maternity in touch with what's going on in the organization mm. um, but it's how far yeah. that gets stretched yeah. like does that for yeah. instance do they do they sit in on the project updates i think that's possibly yeah. pushing it a bit yeah. far i think so too but but maybe there's a there's a step behind that that you can do i think so i think i think there's um there's an opportunity to give people a watching brief so if you're saying right okay we're going to start working in an agile way and we would normally have asked these other three people to join the project but because they're on furlough because their, their client work has gone um we won't invite them to work with us or even give us their expertise but we want them to learn this technique so if that client work comes comes back in we can re-employ them and as long as the, I mean it sounds a bit bizarre but as long as they're not contributing to the value that you're creating as a company then I think you can say they're they're watching and learning they're not adding value to the company right now but you potentially can have them on a head start when you re-employ and you start revving up and start getting clients yeah. back in again <clears throat> I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. It's a, no. it's a psychological connection and it's a, it's a technical skill connection too that I think people would probably find quite useful to just watch and see how it's going. Yeah, and I think also there's... Um, I have a friend who's unfortunately had to furlough quite a lot of people and he's... Yeah. Um, most of his team are young yeah. um, and he's, he's feeling that actually yeah. for their well-being, it's not good that they're going to be sitting at home all day on their no. PlayStation or whatever. So what he's trying to do is to encourage them and point them towards resources they can use for training. Yeah. Um, and, and he's, he's perfectly happy if their yeah. training is relevant to work or not, but it's just keeping yeah. them active. It's keeping their minds going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's an interesting mix we're getting in the chat channel here. So I think this session is both uh, a bit of a methodology and also some very quite nicely cleansing, purging type thoughts people are sharing. Yeah. Um, so I'm quite happy to keep riffing on some of these because I think once we get handles on, on processes and a bit of stability in, in how we deal with the work, we can sometimes then spend a bit more time on thinking, well, how am I feeling? What do I need? I've got the work nice and organized now, but, but what do I need now? I'm distant and mm. remote and all that kind of stuff and, and, and you can, you can, you've got to have the two in mix right you've got to have your work going well and you feeling good about how you are in this new temporarily lockdown situation so i quite like that people are, uh, are riffing on this one of the things i will say about agile is that in the real world when people have come together in real spaces it's brought an incredible sense of camaraderie to that because you yeah. feel like you are in this thing together and i think if we don't do more things like that we will feel increasingly separated and just churning through stuff and zoom calls yeah. and we, i think we've got to create a little kind of you know a unit feel yeah yeah interesting okay so let's let's get back to back to agile again um we've done some check-ins we've got some check-ins going yeah where do we go where do we go next after that so we're doing one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think we need to do is work in these, what they call sprints. Okay. So these, these things on the roadmap are deliberately there to show what we can do between now and the end of the week or, or whatever time period we want to set up. And then we kind of review them as we go through. And there's a ritual in Agile that I, that I really like and is massive in value, which is when you've gone from the start of sprint one to the end of sprint one, you have what's called a retrospective. And you say, how did we do last week? What can we do better next week? Who felt lost? Who felt in charge? Who felt what? And you just do this thing about how did we get through last week and what's good to take to next yeah. week? And all that, kind of, you know, what do we want to lose? And that, you know, we never do that in the real world, except when you work in Agile, because it's part of the ritual. What a, what a valuable thing that is for now, right? To review on a week's worth of work and go, how did we do and what can we do differently? So I think we should definitely yeah. do that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Anthony asking for um, sources of information to expand knowledge on Agile working. 
Yes, uh, actually what I've done is I've created a link to um, a site. I'm just going to go and get the link and put it in the chat window, but we can also share it. I've put lots of stuff on a, a thing called Scoop It, which is where you can curate lots of um, information. I've called it Agile in HR, but it's not really. It's Agile Working. Yeah. So that link, that link will get you to some videos, some articles, some books and reference points. So it will back up what we're saying here. Brilliant, brilliant. And, there, and... Are, there aren't many people... Who've, who've written the book, sorry, who've written the book that says, how do you do Agile in a crisis time when everybody's, nobody's written that book yet. <laughs> so yeah. we're having to adapt it. Yeah, yeah. and the, I think it's important to point out when you go, when you go to Google and start searching for it, you'll yeah. find some incredibly geeky oh, yeah. articles about how mm. to do it and how it's done in Silicon Valley. Mm. And, that, and that's, you mm. know, that's good stuff, but that's mm. usually way more serious mm than um than, than yeah. most people want to get into so yeah um, i know some yeah. of the work you've done you've got the basic framework um yeah, yeah. and just yeah. start working with the basic framework the other exactly. piece on agile is it's still not well enough adopted for there to become a standard no no and, and in fact i don't know whether it ever will jonathan because i think agile by name agile by uh, nature yeah. i think if you try and define it it'll almost stop being what it should be so yeah. I get what you mean, though, that there are perhaps uh, a few fundamental core things that really hold the thing in the space it should be and allow you to do lots of nice, customized, adaptive things. So maybe that's what you mean, like an underpinning kind of platform and then stuff that sits on top. Yeah. 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 OK. Yeah. So I'm, I'm aware I want to be very conscious of people's time. We're coming up on the uh, up towards the hour. Mm. Um, retrospective quick, have we yeah it has yeah. yeah um have we have we talked about retrospectives enough yeah so i think we do them like this on a chat uh, we can do them in a document and people just type in comments we can do them in a thread in slack or whatever it doesn't have to be a replication of a meeting as long as you get the chance to unpack what you felt and did that was useful and not so useful other people do the same you then yeah. can agree an adapted way forward for the following week i think that cycle of do one thing and then re reflect on the day and then start that off at the beginning of the day, then do a weekly reflection on the yeah. end of the sprint, if that's how long it works. And then right at the end of the project, just go looking back on the whole thing. If we did this again, what would we do differently? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good one. There's, when you're starting to get into Agile, there's an incredible kickback against what went wrong. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And and being open about what went wrong, yeah. and sometimes that's a case of how you approach it. Um, yeah. But it is such an important thing because we, you know, we've just got to, we've got to bring yeah. these things out to We have at the end of just about every meeting, mm. we have two agenda items. We have www. So what went well? Nice. And then we have um, EBI. Even better if. Oh yeah, cool. Um, and works. just two two sort of fairly non-threatening ways of putting it. Yeah. And we try and pick out what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. And out of that, we can work out what we can do better next time. I think that's definitely the case. And in fact, Katie's put a comment in here about, does the employer have to provide equipment like a chair? Whereas dining cha table chairs are not like office chairs. They totally are. The only thing I'll say to that is there's an agile mindset which says, don't sit in the same place all the time if you can avoid it, if it's not meant for ergonomic support. So um, if you're sitting in the dining table and you have got another place where you can go and work, use the Pomodoro technique to do... I think I've done an hour in this seat. Can I, can I go and do it somewhere else? Um, Cause I think actually that movement and that setting up in a different place is probably not as disruptive as it sounds because it will keep your posture in mind. It will stop you getting um, back and wrist and arm injuries. Um, yeah. But should the employer provide chairs? Well, they probably will say, well, it's only temporary right now. If it's a more permanent thing, we might have to look at that. Yeah. yeah I mean, we, again, I don't want to keep harking back to breathe, but, in the first few days after we said, right, everybody working from home, we allow people to go into the office and pick up the kit. Yeah. Um, so nice. You know, yeah, I, checked, I checked out on the office um, last week and you no, know, two thirds of the chairs are missing. All the monitors have gone, the keyboards mm. are gone and the you know, mm. and that, that's something I think just makes life a little bit easier. Mm. Um, as yeah. to whether there's a legal requirement, um, I think you're right. I, I, I'm not sure what I can do is to get the, um, the content gurus back at breathe to to do yeah. some investigating on that we've done a fair amount of work with a company called posture people based in brighton oh, yeah. um they're awesome guys they've got some some guides that we'll share um about um, that you can share with your employees about how to 
try and yeah. set up a home workstation yeah in a, in a sensible yeah. way but it's yeah no it's 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 a really good way of thinking as to how how we can get people one good thing about using agile is sometimes you could t take uh, you know the back of a door or a wall space and write post-it notes out still stick them on there send a photo send it to your yeah. teammates to say look i did a bit of my own stuff i've captured so actually that will get you movement it will get you off the dining room chair because agile in the real world often works where people are standing up moving around writing on walls doing stuff in unorthodox ways so actually if you adopted some of them in the home they might actually be quite cool yeah yeah, absolutely. So just trying to wrap this up in the last few minutes, um, some of the pre-thinking that you did around this about the, the top tips, mm. I think there's some awesome ones in there that we need to, we need to just okay. pick on. The very, very first one you've written there as a tip is learn through doing. Yeah. It's not yeah. something that you can theorize over until you try and no. work out how best to do it. You've got to get in there and get messy. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And agile sort of encourages that anyway. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, do a bit of research. So yeah, like you said, do a bit of Googling, find some headline stuff. I mean, one tip I found is if you're Googling Agile and then you get loads of links, just go to the images bit on Google and just see what little diagrams and documents and models are there. Start with them because they're a little bit easier than reading lots of long form text. Yeah. Um, couple of questions just come in. Um, yeah. Do Breathe have a health and safety policy around home working? Um, not totally up to speed on whether we do have that or not, but what we'll do is we'll we'll definitely. I know Nick, our head of contents, on the webinar, um, and I'm sure he's he's jotting that one down as a as a must have. Um, the other one from Jane, which is a really important one, is from an insurance perspective, um, mm. mark that people are working from home. Mm. Um, so again, mm. whatever the system you use to to manage your employees, mm. there's no doubt some way there of. Mm. Of, of marking in breathe you can mark a location mm. so you can say where the person's working so you might have an organization mm. that some people are working from home some are in the office and some are on site some are on furlough um so yeah that's yeah. A, that's a really important one to do i mean the health and safety policy on home working is a really interesting one because if you haven't got one and you want to do one get a team of people to work in an agile way to build it for you yeah yeah don't yeah. don't let normal get in the way of anything i'd say right now there's also you know i um there are there are there are people in throughout this whole crisis that are are giving their all um, yeah. And, you know, number one on that list has got to be anybody in the NHS and the medical services. They're doing oh. a fantastic job. Further down the list of people that I think are doing a superb job uh, are the HR consultants, the independent HR consultants yeah. around the UK who are just Gee. working all the hours under the sun to try and help their clients. I so for things like policies mm. and procedures, many of them will have mm. that kind of document. If it's not free on their website, they'll have it mm. easily available. So, I, you know, I'd encourage... Yeah everybody to go and look out for, for some expert and, help. And on that point, I'm seeing such a lot of generosity where people would normally be saying, well, I've got the solution to that. They're all sharing it yeah. like shamelessly. And I think that's so nice. And actually going back to Agile, in Agile, that's how it works in Agile. We don't hoard our work. We share it shamelessly because when yeah. we find something that works, it's in our interest to help our colleagues do the same thing. Yeah. So um, that comes back to the whole narrate the work bit. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and from that perspective, we have uh, as Breathe, I mentioned our, our awesome content team. They've been focusing themselves completely on how they can help people in this in this moment. Um, so there's there's a stack of really good content on the Breathe blog. We've just released our second culture economy report, oh, which nice. we've actually sort of pivoted towards how company culture can help in an environment like this. Yeah. So again, that's available off the Breathe website. Um, yeah, cool. That's good. Then. Interesting read and loads of loads of really good things there. So, um, I think oh, we nice should, comments. we should wrap yeah. up there. Appreciate yeah. everybody's questions and comments. Um, we just were keep, agile. yeah, there you go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, um, so Perry, a pleasure. Thank you. Same. Loved it. Um, imparting Great. wisdom. Yeah. Um, mm. if we get feedback that this was a useful thing, mm. then are you open for us to, to have oh, another yeah. session? Oh yeah, definitely. And it, and it might be that we can do a bit more of a surgery type thing and, and people can find me and you and send us messages and we can share things. I mean, it doesn't have to stop here, does it? Yeah, we're, no, we're, absolutely. we're open. Yeah. For any yeah we're, we're all, we're all in it together as everybody yeah. says. Mm. So look, um, 
Love the fact that everybody's uh, joined us for now. Thanks, Perry. Thanks, everybody. And Thank um, yeah. I'll see you all soon, the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Stay well and all those other things and be agile. Yeah.